deep, deep in outer space to planet Earth. To the red rocks of Sidon comes a time, an event, a place, a message of making special guest here today. It's someone has been tested for what is true, what is real about this phenomenon, what has been challenged by the media, by the, the government, by people of all kinds, and they stay in their truth for the reality of their experience. That is a hero to me. And that's someone who withstood the test of time. He's um, probably the most well-known contactee that exists in 1975. He was working in the forest in Arizona. A ship landed. He was with a crew of people and he ran out of the truck towards this light and he was blasted and his crew left him there and they thought maybe this ship was after them. And um, they came back and he wasn't there and he was missing for five days. He was not to be found anywhere. After five days, he arrives, he shows up at this, at this telephone booth when they had telephone booths and he calls his brother and there were huge search parties looking for Travis Walton and he only remembered about a half hour on the ship, but he has stood by this story because it's true and he's been challenged but we should give someone like Travis a big hand for being here today and sharing his story and sharing the truth with us. So Travis Walker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Thanks for coming. Um, it's been 45 years, but uh, in spite of that, um, interest in what happened uh, has uh, in steadily increased over the years uh, for all over the world. You know, I'm getting, um, you know, comments and requests for books from uh, countries. I, I have to go look at the map to see wh where that is. You know? <laughs> but um, I think that we are standing on the, a precipice, sort of a... Uh, uh, the the um, I don't what's the word you know for uh, uh, a threshold a threshold that's the word yes yeah. <laughs> we are standing on the threshold of a whole new uh, perspective on this phenomenon um, there's so many things that are coming together all at once um, don't underestimate this uh, Mars lander uh, thing uh, that uh, is going on. Um, uh, the uh, <laughs> okay, okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, this Mars Lander thing, you've got um, uh, the the greatest potential uh, to confirm for uh, people who would prefer to think otherwise that there can be life outside of this planet. Uh, you would think that would be kind of uh, uh, baby stuff at this point. You know, astronomers, uh, the science behind the idea that this one little blue ball in space would be the only source of life, life in, in the entire universe. <laughs> not, not in this house. <laughs> uh, that's that's uh, what's ridiculous. That's what's silly, you know, for people to think, uh, we have to be alone. They've come. Uh, they they uh, began with a an assumption that uh, it's here, but it's nowhere else. We've got literally billions, no trillions of uh, stars twinkling in our night sky, and you think every one of those are just there 
to decorate the night sky. Uh, the, um, the astronomers used to have something called the Drake equation. It was a formula. You could estimate the number of um, possible life-supporting planets in our galaxy. And um, the numbers that they would plug into their, you know, just uh, letters standing in for variables uh, have changed dramatically. It was only this last year that NASA confirmed that um, virtually every star has about a dozen planets. And you, you might wonder how they know that. How can they see that far? Well, there's a technique where they measure the amount of light. And when it dims intermittently at a certain interval, that's proof that uh, a body is passing between us and it. And uh, because of those kinds of calculations and those kinds of observations, uh, it's a virtual certainty that uh, that... Every star has about a dozen planets, which increases the number that you would plug in uh, to these variables in the Drake equation uh, for the number and the possible number of uh, uh, life supporting planets in the universe. Not just, you know, so many people, uh, you look at the night nice sky and say, okay, that's the Milky Way, that's our galaxy, but. Uh, many of these uh, points of light are actually entire galaxies uh, the size of our Milky Way. Our galaxy, uh, there's so, so many of these uh, 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 clumps of matter, whatever you want to call it out there, that, that uh, so many of the things we, we uh, observe and take as stars are actually entire galaxies like, like uh, the Milky Way. So the odds of uh, there uh, not being any other life in the universe are truly <laughs> astronomical. <laughs> but um, we're, on the, we're on the threshold, threshold of uh, uh, confirming that. The Mars lander uh, came down in a place on Mars that is uh, the most likely place to discover the traces of ancient life. Uh, the um, presence uh, around this crater of uh, signs of erosion by water are unmistakable. And so the likelihood that something's going to be discovered there is, um, is extremely great. Um, so it's not, like, it's not like a moon landing. Moon landing, you know, it's just right out there. We've been there a bunch of times, and <laughs> there's going to have some more people go there. But have have even even um, uh, a lander, a, a remote transmitter, uh, giving us information about what's on Mars. It is truly astounding. A lot of people don't understand the incredible distance Mars. You know, uh, although it's the closest, um, actually. That, that lander had to go like you know, eight months or something faster than the speed of sound to get there. Uh, that's, that's very, very far away. And to contemplate sending human beings there is truly a profound uh, uh, paradigm shift, uh, several orders of magnitude bigger than going to the moon. <laughs> so we have on the calendar... Uh, the potential release of information that our government has been keeping under wraps. For so long, people have uh, pushed and pushed for disclosure, and I was always saying, that might not be a good idea, you know, because um, the technology that they have under wraps um, uh, keeps our enemies uh, um, in doubt about whether they could... Um, uh, overcome us. Uh, so the um, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I finally got my sound working. That's okay. Um, I I always thought it was a good idea for uh, 
our government to keep something secret. But this idea of ridiculing people who see things and experience things, uh, it just wasn't working anymore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they were not succeeding in destroying the credibility of the witnesses. They were destroying their own credibility. So now they have to just come clean and say, yes, there's um, uh, things here that are not ours. And um, at least at least this much of a concession that uh, uh, we don't know what it is. They probably do, do know a lot more than they're saying. But um, the uh, order to reveal what is known uh, sort of reclaim some of the government's credibility uh, in this matter um, is really uh, a threshold for a whole new uh, view of this subject. Uh, and um, if there was ever a time that uh, what might have been discovered by the Mars lander already when would they make the announcement? I think it would be kind of, I don't, I'm not saying I know anything about it, but, you know, if they were going to time the release of such information, uh, why not include it with this uh, uh, revelation that's coming up in March? So uh, we have uh, an official confirmation of things uh, coming about. Uh, it's... Uh, paradigm shift, you know, like we've been talking about. And I think uh, this uh, book right here is very timely in terms of uh, uh, getting us ready for that because um, we're not ready. It, it, it's pathetic. I mean, the people in this room are probably ready, but uh, <laughs> uh, it, we're a bunch of savages who are speaking for Earth, you know, self-appointed spokesperson. Right? <laughs> um, there's a lot that needs to be done, a lot of, a lot of changes that need to be made in order to uh, make um, the acknowledgement and the interaction with um, um, beings from other worlds to not be uh, cataclysmic and catastrophic, because potentially it is. And it's not their fault. It's our fault. It's just, we're not ready, and we ne need to do the kinds of things and uh, increase the kind of understanding that will uh, make that uh, beneficial, as we all hope it would be, uh, rather than a catastrophe, uh, which it could be if we're, if we're not ready. So um, there's much... On the horizon, so many people have been saying uh, that uh, they feel that uh, something's about something big. So big, uh, they they feel the shift coming, and uh, it's uh, it's a major deal, and I, I I'm excited about it. You know the the uh, the um, you no. Know, when you had your um, contact experience, you weren't ready, but do you feel like you went through a transformation? Alan uh, is asking about the, the changes I've been through since my own experience. At the time, uh, it was called an abduction. It was uh, uh, horrific to me and my crew. And... Um, it was perceived very negatively at the time, and uh, that I think that uh, helped um, motivate a lot of the attacks and the resistance that we got because it was frightening. People are afraid, and so if they don't want to believe something, they'll come up with a justification for disbelief. And um, that was what hung over our heads for so long. Um, but it has changed. There's been a paradigm shift. Uh, I had 45 years to think about it, so gradually <laughs> it came uh, apparent to me that the idea that the way I interpreted it initially uh, wasn't correct. I woke up in a great deal of pain. I felt like I was dying. I mean, it, it, was, uh, it was the greatest fear and pain all combined with seeing 
these beings and being in this situation. So it was as, just about as maximally tra uh, traumatic as, as could be. But over time, the fact that uh, I was returned at all and uh, was in excellent health after that, um, all kinds of medical tests, um, started to shift my uh, concept of these beings as, uh, you know, Hollywood has done, you know. Even as late as when the movie came out, you know, the idea that these were invading monsters uh, was something that, that I wasn't completely um, divorced from yet. But mm -hmm. gradually, you know, you, you got to uh, think about um, the amount of technology that's involved here. If these beings um, had bad intentions, uh, it'd be over. Already. I mean, these, it's, they've been coming here for decades. This, this is not a new phenomenon. It goes way back. And um, if they really wanted to replace humans on this planet, well, we'd have never known what hit us. It'd be <laughs> poof, you know. Uh, Did you now, say they revived you? In retrospect, rather than them uh, striking me with a weapon, you know, maybe perhaps thinking that I was approaching the craft was a threat to them, but on the contrary, some sort of discharge uh, from the craft that was just inherent to its presence there uh, accidentally injured me. And at that point, they felt responsible to take me aboard and with the kind of technology that they had, uh, were able to revive me. I'm grateful for that. And um, other things over the years have uh, uh, pointed uh, to me um, heavy, heavy weight in the uh, direction that these uh, uh, beings uh, are not uh, warlike. I mean, what sort of uh, hope would we have as a species if we could could think that? 200,000 years from now, 2 million years from now, we're going to still be making war on each other and new, creating new weapons, you know. You have, to, you have to believe that at some point that would have been done away with. So um, these uh, civilizations are vastly older than us just based on the um, uh, estimation of these, the age of these star systems. Now, I'm sure there are... Uh, alien species that aren't as advanced as us. But those are not the ones that are coming here. <laughs> the cave aliens are staying home, and it's the ones who are way ahead of us who are coming here. And so uh, that, that, that's, that's my, you know, I, I argue with people, and meet people will say something like, uh, uh, what about these... Um, People have been dissected by aliens. They find their body and chopped up in place. I said, give me a name. And they give me a name. I go, that's somebody who's telling the story. I'm saying, give me the name of a victim. Give me another name. It was just somebody promoting the story. Nobody can give me the name of a single person that's been dissected and left <laughs> and dumped beside the road. So um, it, it's... You know, it's kind of a Hollywoodish uh, <laughs> to have uh, good guys and bad guys and like that. But to me, you know, the greatest hope for us is that we do have a future to overcome warlike tendencies, uh, discrimination against each other, uh, ways, uh, things that um, right now, you know, I say well, we're savages. Uh, um, if... Uh, some of the atrocities that are being done in um, uh, the name of um, differences between us, the differences in the appearance of people and the such things. Can you imagine how uh, the uh, aliens must think if they're looking that different from us, <laughs> how well they're going to get along in here? <laughs> You know, you think, no, 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 they're going to be in awe of them and all this great science and all this stuff. No, eventually it's going to boil down to they're different from us, so we're going to make up horrible things about uh, what they are compared to us. And 
So we need to get past that. And uh, when we do, that'll be when they can make contact openly, I, I believe. Do you want to talk about any of the other experiences you've had? Because for a long time, you haven't wanted to say that there were other experiences after 1975, and now you're opening up about it. I'm just curious. Well, you know, back when this happened to me, even uh, my, my main supporters, the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, uh, subscribed to the theory that ufologists had that uh, anybody who has more than one uh, experience or defying this, the odds, you know, that if you've had more than one sighting, then, then that's what they call a repeater, and that's not a good thing. So I didn't want to bring up other sightings that I'd had in my life, but, but there had been, had been some. Um, uh, there was a very dramatic sighting in 1970, you know, it's like five years before this, it was, uh, there was a group of us in a car and we found out the community we were passing through. There were several other people that saw this uh, spherical uh, craft. It was huge. And uh, Mike, uh, the crew boss, he was driving the car uh, at the time and he has just completed uh, an, an art uh, rendering of what we saw that night. Uh, we had a whole carload of people. We were going down to Big Surf. I don't know which that is. It's a uh, uh, water park down in Phoenix. And uh, it was so profound. Uh, uh, Mike's little sister said, is it the end of the world? Because it was uh, it was that huge. It was this, uh, there was a cloud cover and this, it's a sphere, glowing sphere came down out of the clouds and you could see the clouds parting around it, very distinct over the surface of this. It was like glass, but uh, glowing, a uh, gigantic glowing sphere. And uh, there was a shaft of light coming down from that. So, you know, there are other sightings, and I, I don't think it does defy the odds. I, I think that in areas like where I live, you know, it's open country and we're, uh, we're outdoors people. We, so we encounter and see things a lot. Uh, I've always uh, shied away from reporting things where I didn't have other witnesses. So. <laughs> <laughs> there was another sighting that I had uh, after the Burbank MUFON meeting. This was uh, 1919, I think. It was like February 19th, I know, because that's my son's birthday. And we were leaving the meeting. Uh, Jan Harzan had just spoken, and uh, Tracy Torme, the screenwriter on the Fire in the Sky movie, uh, had given a talk that night. We saw this little point of light coming towards us. And then eventually, as closer it got, it, it became apparent that it wasn't just one point of light, it was three. And when it, it, by the time it got to us, um, you could see that each of these three lights were on the points of, a, of this giant black triangle. Um, the lights were a lot like these canister lights where you kind of uh, looking up into a um, cylinder of some kind. And, and the light had a shimmer to it, kind of like what you see on the back of a jet with the flames, but it wasn't. It wasn't blue flames. It was a, uh, it was a sort of a. It was mostly white, but had a faint pinkish orange cast to it. But there was only uh, my son and I and my girlfriend that saw it. So I, I wasn't going to say anything about it. But my other son found that Mufon had a website, and by the next morning they had like fifteen other people that had seen this. So here we are in the, in the center of a city the size of Los Angeles, millions of people. This thing comes towards us really fast, really huge, and it stops right over the top of us. And then uh, the point of the triangle, which was on the forward end of it, rotated 90 degrees, and then poof, it, it shot off towards the, the Pacific. And a uh, uh, totally dramatic uh, sighting. My, uh, my son says, Dad, Dad, should we pull over and take a picture? I go, no, no, keep going. <laughs> uh, 
I was very disappointed in myself. I thought I was past all that, you know. <laughs> but I'm going to go back to move on and get the other um, witnesses and see if any of them had taken a picture. Because out of 15, you'd think somebody would get the camera out. You know? but, Unless it's their job, right? No. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, and you know, I don't think you've ever told those stories publicly, have you? Well, I don't know that I've ever told that publicly. I mean, I've told it to some people, but uh, it was a pretty dramatic sighting. Yeah, I mean, the reason you didn't want to, because you thought that initial experience I mean, might be like tarnished. Right. Yeah, you know, people, you know, think, oh, yeah, he's seeing you have a little green man all over the place, you know. <laughs> you wouldn't believe the kind of stories that are told about me, you know. <laughs> people make up stories. So. Um, one guy had uh, was telling the stories that, that uh, he, he made up this real elaborate thing. He was supposed to be the sheriff's nephew and, all, and had all these details about the investigation. It was total nonsense. He was ridiculous that... They, uh, they discovered my stomach was covered with dirty needle marks. Uh, this is ridiculous. I, I went to a doctor right after that, several doctors, and they submitted blood and urine samples to the Maricopa County Medical Examiner's drug screen. Not a trace of any drug whatsoever in my body. And uh, those doctors went over my entire body. They found no marks of any kind except for uh, something that resembled a puncture on my arm, but it was not over any blood vessel. Uh, another story was uh, from a guy that was saying that uh, he had been at the homecoming party that I'd had. It was in Fire in the Sky. That was movie fiction. There was no homecoming party. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. You have people telling these stories in order to sound like they know something or add some credibility to things and uh, to the, to themselves. And uh, it, um, sometimes it's just an effort to uh, um, discredit the story because it's scary and they know that people around them are uh, eager to hear something that is reassuring. Uh, what could be more reassuring than this never happened they, they were out there and stoned out of their minds. But, um, <laughs> But, you know, there was a search party of hundreds of people looking for you. Yeah, there was a massive search, and um, um, they combed the area in great detail. They brought uh, um, tracking dogs in from the uh, prison over at Winslow, and um, they did have footprints, you know, they could still see in the dirt, um, and the dogs could follow the trail to in the clearing to where I had uh, fallen. And uh, that was it. They could find no trail beyond that. Um, there was um, um, a um, radiation um, Geiger counter. Yeah, Geiger counter uh, authorized. Uh, uh, the sheriff requested it, but it was um, a Forest Service person who uh, took these readings. Um, well, um, when you went back to that site years later, talk about the trees that were... Yeah, and uh, this radiation, um, uh, it, it wasn't until like 93 before we discovered that the radiation had affected the growth of the trees. And it was so distinct... Um, we went out there with the uh, Paramount film crew, and there was three feet of snow on the ground, so there was no way to get there without uh, borrowing this giant snow cat from the ski run. It had big white tra treads on it that would go over the top of the snow drifts. We got out there and kind of puzzled a little bit about finding the exact spot, but we did find it. Um, but Mike, uh, the crew boss, had uh, noticed that the trees were different than they should have been. So, without saying anything to anybody, he went back out to the site to confirm this the next spring after the snow melted. Well, how many different trees? They discovered uh, that they had uh, grown v very rapidly. You get one, normally, you get one growth ring for each year on a tree, 
And in this case, by uh, looking at uh, a core sample from the tree, you could see that the tree was like 85 years old at the time of the incident. And then in the intervening 15 years had uh, uh, produced uh, an equal amount of diameter in that same amount of time. So there was a profound shift in the direction of accelerating growth. And uh, Ben Hansen was the host of the uh, Factor Fake television program. He was an ex-FBI guy. He was uh, kind of uh, supervising the expedition there. Uh, and we discovered on some other samples that this, this effect... Um, a forest fire had come through there and killed a lot of trees. So when you cut the cut the tree, you can see that the part of the tree that had developed uh, more rapidly was rot resistant. So the older part of the tree was uh, decaying, and the outer part of the tree was uh, uh, rotting faster than this band in the middle with these thickened growth rings. Ben Hansen had found out that. Uh, researchers um, around the Chernobyl nuclear accident had discovered that the pine, it was a different species of pine trees, but it was Scots pine trees, and they too had uh, experienced accelerated growth in response to the presence of radiation, which is contrary to what you would expect. You would think radiation would kill things and make them, you know, die off or something, but there was that phenomenon. Um, yeah. Don't kill yourself, you said. Don't get sick much. Well, I was, I had a very, um, very good uh, record in terms of, uh, um, you know, in, in 15, 20 years uh, working at uh, Western Moline and uh, at the paper mill, I never called in sick one time. Uh, it could just be a coincidence. I try to, I try to live healthy, but uh, um, maybe that did affect your, your immune system. Maybe it, maybe it did. I was looking uh, fearful that maybe there could be some negative after effects. Uh, like uh, Ken Peterson, he was sitting on the truck next to me, and when I got out, I left the, the door open, and he had developed some skin cancer on his right arm there. So I was thinking that maybe he got a little dose of radiation there that uh, I might have uh, caused that. But they remind you... Travis was on the ship for five days, and then you feel like they Five days. I came back extremely traumatized, went through a whole battery of psychiatric tests, um, um, multiple lie detector tests. Uh, the crew had been accused of uh, making up a story to cover up for having murdered me. Right. So <laughs> uh, the searchers were, weren't just looking for me. They were looking for a body and... Uh, um, my brother, uh, my oldest brother, was there at the site. He worked for the Forest Service at the time, so he was out there taking all these brush piles that uh, we had made during the course of our work on that contract and tearing them apart and expecting to find uh, somebody who had been hacked up with a chainsaw. So what, what does the future look like for you? What is your... You feel like well, I, uh, it, overall, you know, I commented about how negative it was at first. As time went on, there was uh, a gradual shift, uh, uh, battling back against the, the skeptics, the so-called debunkers, uh, was uh, an ongoing uh, process. Every single theory they came up with was shown to be it could not be uh, this explanation. Like for instance, the uh, the. Uh, the drug hallucination theory, uh, aside from the idea that seven people are not going to have identical hallucinations. But, uh, but theory after theory, uh, oh, Travis never was at the phone booth where they found him. Uh, uh, that was all made up story. No, it wasn't. Uh, the call that was made to my family to come and get me was uh, listened into by the operator and reported to the sheriff. <clears throat> so they sent some deputies over there to uh, investigate. But you, I mean, it's unbelievable. He was on a ship for five days. He's standing right here. I mean, maybe we've all been on ships, but and, but maybe that is our future. Actually, I made a joke when we were on the cruise, we were on the cruise, that UFO cruise, 
and we were sailing from uh, San Diego to, to Mex uh, Mexico, and I said, now we can all say we've been on a ship with Travis. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but thank any 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 words of wisdom you want to leave us with? Uh, well, keep your feet on the ground <laughs> and stay in the truck. <laughs> Thank you, Travis. Thank you. Let me just show people. Travis has some books here. He's going to be selling some books. And, um, and you know, he is here in the long haul for people who um, don't believe this is a reality. Let me just say, these are people are not just friends. They're... They're great supports around the world, supporters of consciousness and awakening and possibility. Um, they have something called the Academy for Future Science, and they just recently relocated to Sedona because... Our office. Yeah, yeah because, their <laughs> office, because JJ and Desiree, they work around the clock. They, they never take a break. They are on it all the time, not just with... UFOs and ETs, but the evolution of consciousness in general. You know, Dr. Hurtop was at the earliest UFO conferences in 1978. He worked with J. Allen Hynek. He knew John Mack. He worked with a lot of people to start to get the truth out. Because as we raise consciousness, we know it's not just us. Our consciousness is actually not Earth-based. It's galactic. And we need to understand that we have... Um, the facility to make that kind of contact with other beings. And JJ and Desiree have been doing this for the last, since 1973. Just want to say, with between JJ and Travis, we've had a few people here who have left the planet for a while and have come back to tell us about it. In 1973, Dr. Hurtock had a transpersonal experience where he did a sacred mantra and and... Ina, the um, divine being Ina, came at, into JJ's physical space and took him to the next level of reality. He bilocated. He bilocated and left with his body, and then he went beyond there. And this was 73, and when he came back, he, was, he downloaded this incredible book, The Keys of Ina, Book of Knowledge, which is prophetic in its way of living multidimensionally. So... Desiree was there. She saw it. She's now running. Nothing would happen without Desiree, really. This whole thing would not take place. They are really good friends. They're linguists. They're pioneers in the field of consciousness and UFO studies. And yeah, I was going to say thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's exciting to be here at your real opening of your. Yeah, we're going to get thank the you. sound. Yes, on. we are so honored to be here. Eight, nine. Yeah, eight. Yeah. Here. You want it? No, go. we're going to try the okay. testing, testing. Eight. We can, oh, without yeah. electronics. No, 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 it's okay. He'll get it on. Here. No, don't, don't touch it. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this happens when... As a matter of fact, we're on our own computer. <laughs> this happens when I'm aboard a ship. They say, don't touch anything. <laughs> okay. It's so we brought a backup system just in case no one found technology. I'm really good with technology. Yeah. We're very honored to be here, especially with Travis and the whole chapter of the cosmic awareness that's now being opened. For the first time, we're going to present some of the documentation that I released many, many years ago. In fact, 42 years ago in Mexico City before a world audience of journalists, investigators, I had the privilege of showing some of the documentation regarding the ETs or the cosmic others. But we're really happy to have this release of this book here because the book, as we were saying, it's more than just nuts and bolts. It's actually the consciousness behind. And I want to say with Travis's commentary, and I'm glad he said that he's had other experiences because what we know is once you've seen any type of extraterrestrial or vehicle, there's that, as Alan was saying, that quantum physics, that entanglement, that non-local awareness. And it's over and over again, that energy is there. So even though there might have been 15 other people in Los Angeles seeing what Travis saw, 
I think a lot of it was there because of Travis, because that linkage is there. And I think that's what's happening to many people nowadays. In 1973, as many of you know, I was given an exceptional experience. I was taken through a beam of light into a higher dimension. And from there, my spirit was taken to a still higher level of intelligent life in the universe. I came back with it was light around my body. You'll see one of the photographs later. I sat down and recorded as best I could the information that became known as the Keys of Enoch. So I have to tell for all the people that enjoy channeling and Dale Anka and all that, this is not channeled information. This is actually kind of an experience that he had that he was relating back to what he saw in his two and a half days, almost three days, that he was off. It was a very sacred experience, and I'm very happy to be here between these pictures of the feminine holy Mother Earth and the Adam and Eve story that continues with us. And I may just say a little blessing. Divine, eternal source of all lights, may all blessings from above be upon us as we open a new chapter in the Evan and Eve story. As we surge into the future, may we be blessed and understand the sacred geometry in this presentation. So we begin with a recent event over the Pentagon. Well, in terms of Dr. Tech's experience, one of the key things in the book is the fact that the tetrahedron, as well as the pyramid, we've actually gone to Egypt. We were the co-founders of the tomb of Osiris, which is underneath the Giza Plateau. So we know that the whole tetrahedron pyramid structure, one being four-sided, the other being five-sided, is very critical. But what was amazing to us is some of these, and you may have seen this. Let's get it going. This was shown in uh, just in Washington over the Pentagon, actually, in December of 2018. It was seen at four in the morning. Now, when I first saw this, I said, oh, yeah, it's another phenomena. I'm not interested. But our good friend, who actually, Dr. Jack, got him involved, Jaime Malsan. Famous um, journalist from Mexico City, Televisa. Actually, when he saw this, he goes, I'm going to check this out. So it turned out that there were actually four different people in three circumstances seeing this exact event. Now, the, what you're seeing here now, of course, we jump now. That was in 2018. This is in 2009. Same similar structure over the Kremlin. So you have the Kremlin and you have the Pentagon. I mean, really. The two superpowers <laughs> have been exposed to this interesting capstone or this triangular geometry, which is very important because in my experience, Enoch, also called Iris in the Arabic and Hanak in the Hebrew, pointed out that we were being given higher knowledge, capsule knowledge of bringing the spiritual and the scientific together, and the triad or the pyramid was that capstone of shown unity. So back to the Pentagon, and so what Jaime found, so there's two guys driving in the car, it's four in the morning, and like they're throwing their camera out the window going, look at this. I mean, you can listen to the sound if you want because it's on Google. I didn't put the sound here, thank goodness. <laughs> anyway. But then there's another guy, this is Jaime interviewed him, in a cemetery, in Arlington Cemetery, shooting at night with his wife. He sees this. He actually took pictures of it as well, but no video, because he only had a still camera. And then another older man driving the car actually reported it as well. He didn't take any pictures. So you have, literally, when you have three different circumstances, four people all together saying, you know, this is something they saw you have to start believing it. It's an amazing thing. So the keys of Enoch tell us that the pyramid is a central building block. It's connected with the geometry of the carbon atom, which is our physical body of the incarnation. It's connected with the great societies of the past, generally built around pyramidal grids. It's also found on the surface of Mars. My book, The Keys of Enoch, was the first to show the actual declassified pictures of the pyramidal grids in the Elysium Quadrangle on Mars. Those of you. <laughs> we'll look very carefully at the details. Now there's a reason why I have this information. I passed my experience on to NASA, and when they found the pyramids of Mars, I asked, oh, hey, could I have a release of the documentation I predicted? So my book is the only book in the world that it shows the details of the pyramidal structures on Mars. So we're talking about something of architecture far beyond the nuts and bolts of what MUFON and ICAP have been involved with for the last 70 plus years. We're talking about a new civilization in our solar system, an old civilization, yes, in our solar system, where the ongoing intelligence design is still continuing with us, brings all of us into a completely new understanding of a 
consciousness cosmology that we need. In other words, besides the scientific, we need the spiritual. And in this book, we have a teaching of the cosmic hierarchy from the highest levels of the divine source to the practical levels of the worker bees, which represent the humans on Mother Earth. So we're really excited about the release of this book. It's actually just going to be coming out, I think, May 4th is the official release day. But what's really exciting is June. I think some of you know about this, is that when the COVID bill went through in January, there was a six-month period when Marco Rubio, who's a senator from Florida, said that he put into the bill as just a sign that the Senate Intelligence Committee, which he's part of, is to have access to all FBI, NSA, CIA, and any other alphabet agency, whatever, and then they're to get the information. Of course, he really just wants it for himself, right? <laughs> just kidding. But then they're supposed to filter that and give it back to us, and they had six months to do it. That six months will be June 24th. Actually, it comes out to, I think, 47 years to the day that Kenneth Arnold was flying over Washington and actually cited uh, a UFO and started coining that term of, I think, unidentified flying object or what? Before it was flying saucers. Or yeah, flying saucers. It was flying saucers. Sa- sa- came up yeah. with the term to make this rather vague. It was Listen. flying saucer. But anyway, so we are really excited. If they happen to really release information, then this book will be like key in terms of providing people a higher consciousness about it. So I just want to say, but they're releasing things all along, as you know, the Nimitz, which we'll show you. Alan had a great video, so we're going to try in the break to really get you to show, see so that. When was the Nimitz event? 2004. And that was another key date of Dr. Hertek. predicted in the Keys of Enoch. Was the name of our vice president? Kamala. Kamala also predicted in the Keys of Enoch. So 64 areas of science. Now this book was put to the side. My experience was considered crazy far out. In the 70s? <laughs> Too far out. But now things are falling in place. What I was shown is we would have to go back to that picture. The very first picture in the Keys of Enoch is the pyramid over Mother Earth. That picture represents the capstone reality that we're beginning to see all over the world according to naval intelligence releases over the Three ships in uh, the area off of California, as well as earlier events in the, on the Atlantic side, we are being shown a central model of evolution. Right. And so I just want to say the most recent release was, this is supposedly leaked from the Navy, of what they really are calling already pyramid ships. And this was seen July 2019. It was also off the coast of California, which is similar to the Nimitz. I'm going to show you. So it's just interesting that uh, how many people saw this? It just came out about 10 days ago, a week ago. All right, well, Google it. Navy, uh, pyramid, UFO. You'll find this exact picture and the information behind it. So what's going on? This is the most recent releases. They're only going back for disclosure, really, uh, since, we'll say, the turn of this century, which hasn't been that long, I hope. So you have the November 2004, the Nimitz in Princeton. That was at least a two-day sighting, and many people have seen that. What we just showed you was the USS Russell, July 2019. There is also July 2019. Of course, the U.S. three ships, U.S. Uh, kid, uh, Peralta, and uh, Finn. So they also have been seeing, so this is starting to come out slowly, 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 so people are more prepared. And then if we wanted to take the East Coast, of course, we don't really care about the East Coast, that's why we're here in the West Coast, but they did have in 2014, uh, these are the Hornets, the uh, FA-18s, Hornets off the coast of Virginia. That was actually, some of this took place over a month's period of time. They were seeing vehicles. Um, Years ago, we actually were good friends with... uh, uh, the Mercury 7 astronaut, uh, Gordon Cooper. And when he was flying over, they used to fly the planes on the west side of Germany, and there was MiGs flying on the east side of the line of Germany. They looked up in 1951 and saw a flotilla of vehicles. And actually, two days, he reported this to the United Nations, two days of flotilla in 1951. So Gordon was a friend. We got him involved with Sidney Sheldon, the famous American writer, in a book called Doomsday Conspiracy. Things that would come about that people would not wake up. Of course, 
Again, this was put to the side. So much science fiction. But anyway, one more sighting, Eastern Seaboard. These are all official releases or at least leaks from government authorities, mostly the Navy. That's really interesting. Dr. Jack and I were good friends with an admiral, and he said, yeah, no, we see him all the time. The Navy <laughs> has kept the Constitution. Yeah. But all anyway. of those of you who understand the threat to our country understand what's going on behind the scenes. It's not just uh, politics as usual. It's something more important. It's the whole threat of freedom of civilization. Well, so we're, we're hoping that there will be a, a major release in June and the ufologists are everywhere from like Whitley Strieber says nothing is going to come out, you know, to other people who are part of the whole, you know, like uh, to the Stars Academy saying, yes, they're going to release things. And Elizondo just came out and said, you know, the one thing they really hate is nuclear. So, you know, that's been a problem because we're still using nuclear and the ETs don't want any nuclear. And we think one of the reasons, there's several reasons why the government's kept this covered since, we'll say, 47 would be maybe the most major date with Roswell and Kenneth Arnold. And this, it's multiple fold. One, there's too many types of intelligences out there. They don't all have the same agendas. Number two, uh, we don't have the technology or they're giving us the technology and we don't quite, you know, we can't manage controlling our scene. You know, they're in control. We're not in control. And then a few other well, the, issues. Well, the main point, and this was pointed out to Dr. Heineck when I was with him and Dr. Schoa in Brazil many years ago, is the spiritual piece of the puzzle is missing. And that goes into quantum physics. It goes into the experience that both Desiree and I have had and working behind the scenes with SRI, Center for Research Institute, and some of the best minds in the country, and why we published a recent book with Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher called Mind Dynamics in Space and Time. And we, the whole reality is built into our consciousness as we expand. We began to learn the sensitivity and the language outreach we need to correspond with our cosmic friends. A picture here is from the very first page of the Keys of Enoch. It shows a Pyramidal capstone with multicolors, showing all traditions connected with the pyramid as a form. But behind that, there is the scroll of Esther. The scroll of Esther is the only scroll in the Bible that speaks of God's blessings through Esther, who is naming Starborn, from Ethiopia to India. In essence, we are going through a replay in the Middle East of what was there at the time of Esther between Persia and Israel. Persia now is Iran. Israel represents the West in some respects. Both countries are in this dialect, and we have to go beyond this to understand what John the Divine speaks of as the heavenly Jerusalem. Wouldn't it be cool to find out that the pyramid complexes in many, many places of the world, maybe not every single one of them, was because they had seen a pyramidal UFO? I think that's so cool. And in actuality, Ben Rich from Lockheed Skunk Works, which is the black budget end of Lockheed, says, you know, we have all the technology, everything you've ever seen on Star Trek or Stargate. We've done that or decided it wasn't worth our time. And that was a quote from this gentleman, Ben Rich, who actually was the head of this department. So we do feel like uh, there was a man named Professor Eshad from Israel. How many people heard about that? That was, yeah, just he, was, he, he actually post. said that some of our people are being taken through the gates and different vehicles to Mars. I don't know if we really want to go that far on everything, but that's what an official who was part of the, we'll say, the security space program of Israel said he knew about. But he said that the ETs themselves don't think we're prepared. And that is, we, we say that it's not only because we'd be in fear, but it's also that we're not willing to put away our weapons of war, exactly what Travis had said. We're, they really don't want us up there. Not really, so not right now. So what is the raising of consciousness. Their message is they come in peace, but they also want us to recognize unity and peace. And, and it's also, not all of them. There's a few that don't care. <laughs> so to that end, we look at one of the diagrams of the, the cosmic others. On the far right, we see the Edmund Eve story. And then we have those that are the insectoid, the reptilian, and we would call the variations of the greys. There's over 70 uh, categories, some say 82. We've documented some of these with our work in Africa and Central America and the Pacific. But you can understand now from the standpoint of uh, Pentagon researchers, if you have such a large array a spectrum to deal with, how can you make this simple for the American public? And of course, this has been the great dilemma. 
and why we have suggested over the years, and I've worked with several of the key researchers, like Dr. Andre Puharic and, and Gordy Cooper and some of the other astronauts, we have to use a, a higher vibratory expression of love, and unconditional I love. And I have to say that, yes, there are reptilians, yes, there are insect toys, yes, there are all these different types of other intelligences because the planetary systems really, you know, are suitable for them, and they eventually can get into spaceships and travel and have their own atmospheres. Uh, according to Wendell Stevens, the uh, the ones he had known most about, they don't eat like we do. They don't have the intestines. He made a big joke about, you know, how much feet of intestines we have they don't need. But what they do is they actually rub their skin with an algae. And that's a possibility, too. I mean, I wouldn't want to do it personally. We really like coffee and cake and things like that. But, you know, ultimately, they like that. But I think what's really interesting is in our uh, belief in Dr. Dick as a tremendous cosmology he gained from seeing the other side, but actually that we're also on other planets. There's also the tall whites, there's the extended skulls, there's many different ones, but we also are on other planets. So we don't even believe in our personal reality that we're hybrid intelligence. I know that flies in the face of a lot of other uh, people who talk to you about that. We believe, and it goes back to the ancient book of Enoch, not just the keys of Enoch, that the flood actually wiped out the hybridization that was going on on this planet and that it got back to the original Adamic species. Yes, In our chapter seven. Yeah, yes, we've uh, done some uh, breeding with Neanderthals and Denisovans and things like that that had also been on this planet, but basically the hybridization was not part of that our That was the planet. shocking thing yeah, we found when we went under the pyramids in Egypt is they had fossilized remains of creatures that were half bird half snake. Experiments that were kept as models. And we also found, as Desiree had mentioned uh, earlier, that we were shown where to find the tomb of Osiris. Osiris is the type of pre-Christ figure in the ancient world representing uh, bringing of music to the earth and ascension. But we found that in going through the pyramidal uh, areas of major cultures, something happens. There's sort of a vortex energy field. And here is a picture of yours truly in Tula, Mexico, about 20 years ago, and I was singing the names of God in Hebrew Aramaic, which in my work of meditation, along with the Sanskrit, works and elevates the, the inner dynamics of the mind very quickly. And a man was taking a picture of his wife in the foreground and was able to capture the, the light force of the ultra-terrestrial dimension that came around my body. So what am I saying? We're going also into higher levels of intelligence, not simply the ETs, but far beyond the ETs, the extra celestials, and then the ultra terrestrials, the forces, the avatars referred to in their teachings of the scriptures of the Far East, as those who are the chief management, the chief executives of the Godhead. So we are being prepared to take, as it were, several opportunities to go forward depending upon the levels of our spirituality and our science that has to be brought together. And so our chapter in this book, I think it's chapter three, right? Uh, mm -hmm. It talks about, starts with Beam Me Up Scotty about how teleportation and all that is a real reality. And the more you look at it, wormholes, I mean, scientists are coming out and saying, yeah, you know, ultimately things can go through wormholes and not be destroyed. So this is all modern, modern quantum physics and science. And then it ends with the fact um, of what we're talking about here more. Putting the light, of, the capstone on your head, realizing that each of you has a higher self or the over self. And the breaking of the seven seal opens the mind by bringing both left and right hemisphere together into higher unity of recognizing the day of graduation that's before us. We are going to graduate. As a planetary species, it's going to come in many directions. The skeptics will have their last day uh, and the last period of, shall we say, fighting with the, the, the monsters, the dinosaur mentality will fall away and uh, a new chapter of life will reemerge and that will be the continuation of the Adam and Eve story. Right. So ultimately, I think what everyone's feeling here in Sedona, and that's why also people are flocking to Sedona, is really, you know, there's a space-time overlap taking place all over the planet, which means more and more information, more and more wisdom, more and more higher energy is coming into our presence. So we really 
when we talk about a consciousness field, it's very important we don't see the consciousness field as just being earth linked, but that, and it's not just ET linked because there's a whole three and slash four, even fifth dimension of ET experiences. And, and Mark Sims may even talk about the sixth dimension, but we, Dr. Tech was shown there was 24 dimensions in our local universe and we're our local universe is only one of myriads. And we've written papers with Elizabeth Rauscher, very scientific papers on the multiverse uh, because there's many, many realms. So this is all what we're starting to be open to. And our consciousness really, really can reach into those divine realms. And I just want to say for all those people, even though I know I'm preaching to the choir here, you know, <laughs> if, you, if you talk about you know, Archangel Michael materializing, it never means he leaves where he is and comes here. It means he sends his energy and can materialize. So he can be here, there, everywhere. That's quantum physics, non-locality entanglement. He can be everywhere. You just need to call that energy in and he materializes. It's not exclusive. You're not taking it away from anybody else. That's very, no, it's very important that we realize this, that we're not like hogging the show here in Sedona, right? No, I'm just kidding. Well, the two, the two most important things we should take away is scientists have realized now that we are multidimensional. And thanks to the work of Stanford Research Institute with Russell Targ, Harold Pudoff, and others, we realized that we are local and non-local consciousness throughout the universe. And as we illustrate this in our last picture, which is in one of our books on linguistics, we can use certain types of art and music to open up the unity between the left and right hemispheres. This is the higher marriage that John the Divine, I believe, speaks of. It is the marriage that we have with the heavenly Jerusalem, the spheres, of the divine intelligence behind the extraterrestrial, behind the human. And so as we go up the ladder of the evolution, like Jacob, we must call, if possible, the image of the dog, the symbol of peace, unity, brotherhood, and sisterhood. And we also have a book that we cover called Over Self-Awakening, and it really means the fact that we're getting more in touch with our higher selves. And ultimately, when we do, we are existing in fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth dimensional reality, where time is all linked together. And so we can see things from the past and also know things in precognition for the future. And we work with remote viewing as well to be able to really know and see and also help Mother Earth because she needs it at this time. That was one of the things Dr. Jack was shown. 64 areas of science will take a quantum leap, but this planet really is going through some serious changes. And if you have relatives that are stubborn and don't want to listen, just remind them, particularly if they're orthodox and their spirituality, remind them of what Daniel, the prophet of the Old Testament, tells us in chapter 12. Knowledge will speed up and humanity will be numbered with the stars, the Hebrew. We will mean that we will be unified with those who are part of the divine management, who want us to take the way a peace and harmony. Whether we say it in Hebrew or Latin, Pax et Concordia, or in Sanskrit, it means that we have to see all of the mantric energy that we have available as a tool of universal experience, universal consciousness and realization that humanity is a natural cosmophysical reality. We were born to be co-sharers in evolution, co-sharers in the culture and civilizations that make up our universe. Now, actually, ultimately, we are our higher selves and we have just simply come down here temporarily. So if everything stays on time, we're going to have a little panel discussion at the end and hopefully also close with a sacred. So expression. we have two books available at the door. The Keys of Enoch, if you want to know the story of what was found on Mars. And secondly, The Real X-Files. The Real X-Files. <laughs> Mind dynamics in space and time with the top physicists and mathematicians in the United States. So the skeptics have no room to argue. You just point out the fact that the scientists behind the scenes who were once atheists have come forward and have recognized that this is a new chapter, a new paradigm. We must not take this uh, as something that's just going to happen. We still have to engage each of us to be a living transmitter of love and light. And, and these books are about raising your vibration. So as you read through this, it, it hits you on many, many levels. And in order to start to make sense, you have to go to a new level of consciousness. Thank you both, Dr. JJ and Brother Thank you. Thank you.
clear, a big support. They have a very important chapter here. Universal consciousness and the realization that humanity is a natural cosmophysical reality. We were born to be co-sharers in evolution, co-sharers in the culture and civilizations that make up our universe. 